Welcome, Stefan Hartman here, Iron Direct Primary Care, and with Logan. She's going to be telling us about her extensive lab testing with the Dutch test. This is a urinary metabolite test of hormones, and she's done it three times. Mm -hmm. uh, this and is I've, my latest one. And I figured she may as well give us a presentation because this test this is not cheap. What does it run, like 300 bucks? Yeah, I mean, I got a deal because I bought three as a package at a seminar, but typically, yes, I think they run... I think now it's two ninety nine. I want to say I have to check, but it's fairly expensive. Yeah, when we go to these anti aging yeah. conferences, they talk about this test a lot, the Dutch test, and they do. They love it. They love this test. So let's let's talk about this one. Okay, so this obviously he already introduced me. I'm Logan. I'm a PA. I work with Iron Direct Primary Care. Um, this is what the Dutch test looks like. It's actually urinary metabolites, which I feel like is important to discuss. It's not blood, so absolutely no blood involved. You're just going to urinate basically on a couple different uh, different types of papers. So it's only collecting urinary metabolites. It's not collecting an active saliva or serum sample. So the first part is pretty basic. We'll get a lot more into all of these, but the first part obviously is going to give you your basic estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone breakdown, and then your cortisol. Um, so basically, I just put a couple generalizations here. My progesterone overall looks pretty good. Testosterone looks pretty good. My estradiol E2, which is the most active estrogen, is actually running on the high end, at least for this cycle. So it's almost elevated. Um, was this the first test you did? No, this was the third. Okay, this is the last test. This was the last test. In past tests that I've done, okay, my testosterone ran a lot higher my progesterone ran a lot lower. So this is the first one where progesterone, testosterone were pretty good, um, but estradiol was running a little bit on the higher end this time. Um, cortisol is going to, I'll warn you, be very, very confusing for the lay person to understand because we're going to talk about free cortisol and inactive cortisol. So it's going to be very confusing, but I'll do my best to help you understand. But you can see that my total cholesterol, or not cholesterol, excuse me, cortisol production, which is represented by this here, the metabolized cortisol, is actually pretty low. So I'm not producing a ton of cortisol, but the cortisol I have is high in my tissues. So I'm holding on to a lot. The cortisol that I'm making, which isn't much, I'm holding on to, and we'll talk about why that might be. So this next one, oh, I'm trying to get everything in there. I'll start at the top and then I'll kind of scroll down. But basically, this is showing you how I'm breaking down all the estrogen in my body, everything from E1, E2 to E3. E2 we talked about is obviously the most active and abundant form. Um, so I'm kind of on the high end in almost all ranges other than E1. So for whatever reason, I'm producing a lot of estrogen, and we'll talk about why that might be and what I should probably do to address that. But estrogen is basically broken down by three pathways, right? You have the 16-OH, the 4-OH, and then the 2-OH down here. So those are the pathway that it's going to break down. Um, the 2-OH-E1 is the one you want most of your estrogen to be broken down through because it's the least genotoxic, meaning the other two pathways in particular the 4-OH-E1, if you're producing a lot of that, um, it can actually cause some DNA damage. So thankfully, I'm not really producing a whole ton of 4-OH-E1, um, so that's a good thing. Um, I'd like to see more going down this more protective pathway, but still overall I'm doing pretty good. So it's giving my percentages here. So for example, the expected range for that more protective pathway, I'm at 75%. So that's pretty good. I'd like to see a little bit higher. And then the 4-OH, I'm at 8.1. So I'm on the low end of that, which is good. I don't want a lot of estrogen being metabolized down a pathway that can produce DNA damage. So that's a good thing. But the more I can get out of that pathway and even the 16-OH into the protective pathway, I would rather have, obviously, because high estrogen and DNA damage can be a recipe for cancer, particularly breast, ovarian, endometrial cancer, which obviously none of us want. Um, if you scroll down a little bit further, then you can see where it's giving us my methylation pathway, which actually appears to be pretty poor. So if you look down all the way to the left, that little, whatever you want to call this, little depiction is actually showing that my methylation is on the low end. Mm -hmm. So that actually reflects well in another test that I took. So 
it's cool because a lot of this information actually reflects pretty well on a nutri eval test I took. So a lot of it makes sense. So I kind of jotted some notes down here for methylation. nutri eval test, yeah. we'll do that one as well soon. Yeah, we'll do that one too to help you better understand some of this, but it ref reflects pretty well between the two. But example for methylation, things I probably want to focus on are a lot of B vitamins, in particular riboflavin, folate, thiamine. Those are going to help boost your methylation in the detox of the estrogen. Glutathione would be a good one to do. Brassica vegetables um, also can help you go more down this protective pathway. Um, I already talked about the E2. So for high estrogen, there's obviously a lot of things you can do. You obviously want to optimize your weight. You want to have less body fat and adipose tissue and more muscle because adipose tissue can aromatize testosterone to estrogen and cause too much estrogen in the periphery. Um, other than that, you can also, of course, incorporate B vitamins are going to be like huge on this whole presentation because they do so much. Um, DIM, calcium D-glucreate are good products to reduce high estrogen, um, which also can help too with even the symptomatic um, relief of high estrogen, which is, you know, irritability, mood swings, all different types of stuff. So I'm going to focus on B vitamins, DIM, um, calcium D-glucreate. Obviously, trying to optimize my muscle and lose fat. Calcium D-glucarate is pretty potent. Yeah. Uh, I tell patients to go pretty easy on that one because it's a pretty potent estrogen binder. And we don't want to lower estrogen so much that we get low estrogen symptoms, hot flashes, mm -hmm. and so forth. And I think that's like the benefit of like doing these tests and even doing whatever serum, saliva, hormone testing to actually know where you are and see if you really need it. Because if you don't need it, you don't want to take it. But I'm definitely running a little bit on the higher end, which I don't want to, and I don't want the symptoms of high estrogen. I don't like fe feeling irritable and having mood swings. Um, so I will probably do a trial of that and then stop and then maybe retest and see if I'm normal because I'm not going to chronically take things to lower estrogen, right? So I think we pretty much touched on everything. Again, even this can be a little bit confusing, but just to sum it up, you have three main estrogens and you, your body has to break them down. They're broken down through the liver and the gut. So you get conjugation in the liver and then unconjugation in the intestines and that's how you excrete the estrogen. So obviously if your liver is functioning poorly and your digestive system is functioning poorly, you can also do all these things and still have problems. So you need to fix the gut and you need to make sure that your liver uh, phase one and phase two metabolism are good so that you can actually rid these things. And that also overlaps with a lot of these nutrients, nutrients. same ones are needed for the liver for phase one and phase two detox. Mm -hmm. So let's see. So this is kind of like some of this, this isn't a little bit of an overlap of what we just talked about, but also some newer stuff. So I'm not going to talk again about the estrogens because we just did that. We'll get into um, pregnenol or pregnenodi pregnenodiolol in the next slide. So I'm going to talk about the androgens here because that's pretty interesting. So the main focus being at the bottom of the graph. So my DHEAS is actually kind of on the low end. So again, this can be confusing because you have DHEA and you have DHEAS and then you have androgen breakdown byproducts. DHEAS is what we test a lot for in serum. So you can get an idea of that too. But DHEAS is different than DHEA. I just want people to know that it's not the same thing. DHEAS is a sulfated version of DHEA that happens in the adrenal glands. So my actually overall production of that is actually on the lower end. If you look at even the range is 20 to 270 and I'm at 81. 20 to 750. Or 750, excuse me, and I'm at 81. So I'm definitely on the low end of that range, which again could be for any number of reasons, um, molybdenum apparently is a very important product for sulfation. That's where you get the S and the DHEAS. Inflammation, um, again, that's not specific, but inflammation, stress can also drive the sulfation away from DHEA and then push DHEA more to these um, androgen products, the androsterone and the etiocalanolone. So that can be confusing because you don't know maybe specifically what's driving that. So you may have to do some investigation, but definitely for whatever reason, instead of 
my DHEA going into the DHEAS, which is important for a, a whole number of functions in the body, immunity being one of them, I'm converting more to these other two um, androgenic compounds, the androsterone and the ediacolanolone. Mm. So I'm converting more to those where ideally I would be converting more to the DHEAS. Um, so, and just to touch too on those two, you know, metabolites, basically they are neurosteroids, they're androgenic. Um, they both kind of do different things. Interestingly with androsterone, it's actually a pheromone that people can give off and it can alter human behavior. In what way? I don't know, but that's kind of interesting. I couldn't find more research to figure out what that would be, but it's actually a pheromone. So who would have thought? Mm. The ediacolanolone, same thing. It's a neurosteroid um, produced by testosterone metabolism. Um, it can also, though, do some negative things, which thankfully I apparently don't have, which is good. Um, it's also known as a pyogenic steroid, so it can cause fevers, implicated in PCOS, um, it can increase inflammation, cause low iron, leukocytosis. Um, thankfully, I, you know, I don't think you can see the very end of that, but my labs don't show any of that. I don't have autoimmunity. I don't have low white blood cell. I don't have low iron. Um, I don't have a high CRP. My CRP is almost undetectable. So I think it's just a matter of figuring out why I'm not converting more to DHEAS and why I'm driving more towards those steroid hormones. So something is blocking that sulfation and I just have to figure out what that is. Um, they talk about 5-alpha DHT and 5-beta. So my 5-alpha DHT was a little bit higher, which again can produce more androgens, which may explain why I'm producing more of those um, neurosteroid metabolites. So and I'm just above the elevated range. It's not you know, severe by any means, but I'm definitely still driving towards those androgens, which as a female, I don't want that, obviously. Oh, I messed up here. Um, but interestingly, and we'll look on the next slide, despite the fact that my 5-alpha DHT was elevated, my 5-beta pathway was still favored. Mm -hmm. So I'm still favoring my 5-alpha reductase activity anyway is still favored over, or the 5-beta, excuse me, is more favored over the 5-alpha. So 5-alpha reductase is the enzyme that converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which is three times more potent than testosterone itself. So for example, in females and males, but in females particularly who get that chin and jawline acne, usually it's due to high DHT. For men, usually it'll cause hair loss, especially at the crown, and it'll cause an enlarged prostate. So nobody really wants high 5-alpha reductase activity. It's going to affect any, any gender negatively, but women are just a little bit more sensitive to it because we don't have near the number of androgens as males. Mm -hmm. So that's just one thing to note. But yeah, this can be very confusing. So you definitely want to go over this with somebody who kind of understands what all this means because it's you. a lot of information. <laughs> um, You're going to do these. Yeah. <laughs> it's your job. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Did I, you think I touched on everything here? I think yes, I did. Yes, let's it's continue. Just, yeah, it's, it's difficult a lot to, this. to, yeah, it is. This one's thankfully a little bit easier, so not so much. Basically, this part is the progesterone, which we already looked at initially, but it'll show you the 5-alpha and 5-beta. So these are the progesterone byproducts, and this is actually important because the 5-alpha component actually has uh, the propensity to cross the blood-brain barrier and upregulate GABA receptors, which is so important because that's going to help with anxiety, irritability, stress. Um, a lot of research shows that women who have low five, um, excuse me, five alpha, alpha pregnenolone or progesterone metabolites tend to have more PMDD, more anxiety, more irritability. So yeah, it's, pre it's pretty important. Mm. The ways you can support progesterone overall, I would say is vitamin B6, vitamin C, a lot of grass-fed, grass-finished meats, you need saturated fat. Um, zinc would be an important one, but also right. minimizing stress mm -hmm. is very important. Um, high stress is going to drive the progesterone towards um, cortisol more than the progesterone. So it's going to drive the pregnenolone that you need for the progesterone towards cortisol. Um, but yeah, so it looks like overall mine are pretty good on the beta and the alpha side. Of course, I'd like to see the alpha higher because that's going to give me the most benefit. Um, but yeah, it's really important for. Um, GABA receptors.
So it'll help with anxiety. This we kind of already talked about. This is just another depiction of androgen breakdown. So for example, we'd start at the top. It got cut off though with testosterone. Testosterone goes to DHEA. DHEA goes to androstenedione. But then you have the break off here where DHEA can go to DHEAS, which clearly mine is not going that way. It's going straight down this androgenic pathway towards androstenedione, okay? Which obviously I would rather more go towards DHEAS because of the benefits of DHEAS. But I'm continuing down to androstenedione and produce neuroprotective benefits. Correct, which is important for everybody too. So um, it's not that you want high of DHEAS either, but mine is low. I definitely could I've use more. I've seen super high DHEAS in serum in patients who I think are stressed. Probably. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, that's a component of it too. Um, so yeah, you could see mine is definitely driving way more down the androgenic pathway. But I'm still favoring the 5 beta, not the 5 alpha, which is interesting. So despite the fact that I'm producing a lot of these like neurosteroids um, and I'm not producing as much DHES, my 5 alpha reductase activity is actually low and it's favoring more the beta pathway, which I'm happy about because I don't want to have androgenic symptoms like most females. Um, but I feel like I still need to work on trying to get that DHEA more towards going to the DHEAS route rather than these um, neurosteroids because I want the benefits of DHEAS plus I don't want that idioconanolone to chronically be elevated because it can make you predisposed to what we talked about before inflammation autoimmune conditions etc so continuing on this is where it can get very 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 confusing I feel like even for clinicians so you have everybody knows cortisol I feel like that's like like the magic word, everybody's obsessed with cortisol, everybody knows what cortisol is, but there's so much more to it than just cortisol um, itself. So there's cortisone, there's cortisol, there is the enzyme that converts between the two, and then there's high and low and all this. So I'll try to simplify it as much as possible. But here we talk about cortisol, that's the active form. Cortisone is the inactive form, which is important. And then there's that fancy enzyme, 11 BHSD, present in the colon, kidney, and saliva glands that converts between the two, the inactive and the active form. Um, metabolized cortisol basically re represents all the cortisol that you are producing, right? And if you remember in the beginning, I talked about that I'm actually not producing a ton of cortisol overall. Free cortisol is the tissue level, right? So free cortisol is what's in your tissue, what's active, what's happening, and it's doing all the metabolic processes. And that's kind of the most important. Cortisone and cortisol both produced by the adrenals in response to stress. Cortisone is the metabolite of cortisol and not quite as potent. So, you know, cortisol is obviously really important. There's a lot more functions than what I listed, but you just think of like fight or flight response. So blood pressure regulation converts protein to glucose, obviously, because if you're in a fight or flight state, you're not worried about getting big and bulky and muscular. You're worried about energy to fight off the bear. So going from protein to glucose. It's catabolic, unfortunately, depending on the way you look at it. Um, not really a good thing if it's chronically elevated. Um, it's important for immune function. So obviously high cortisol is actually a form of protection for the immune system. When your cortisol gets way, way, way too low and you get adrenal burnout, you actually, actually tend to get a lot sicker and have more infections because cortisol just basically is letting down the gates and letting things happen rather than trying to rev up and protect, protect, protect. So that's kind of important too. There's a lot more, but I'm not gonna go through every single thing, but those are the big ones. So things that can reactivate, meaning take cortisone, the inactive form, and put it back to cortisol, the active form, hypothyroidism, grapefruits, licorice, high sodium and high insulin can all lead to the inactivated cortisone being converted back into cortisol. Things that can deactivate cortisol and bring it back to cortisone, the inactive form, human growth hormone, hypothyroidism, magnolia, ketoconazole, testosterone, citrus peel, 
Um, so this could also be why maybe a lot of men don't suffer as much from high cortisol because they have a lot more testosterone, which obviously is going to inactivate the cortisol and take mm -hmm. it to a more inactive form. Again, it kind of, this all depends on how you look at it. It may be a good thing. It may be a bad thing. It just depends on the individual person. So for me, again, remember my order, overall cortisol production wasn't low, but unfortunately my tissue levels remained high. So the little that I'm producing is sticking around and it's not, it's not leaving. It's not going anywhere. Mm. So again, this is can be a little bit confusing, but that's, there's a lot of ranges on here. So hopefully that made it a little bit of sense. So here we're touching on it again. And this is a pretty cool picture of what actually happens like when your body releases cortisol. Looks like a macaroon. <laughs> your body senses stress at the hypothalamus level and then it's going to release corticotropin releasing hormone to the pituitary. The pituitary is going to say, we have a stress response. We need to release ACTH to tell the adrenals to produce more DHEA and more cortisol. So that's how that happens. It's a whole loop that causes that to happen. Now, a lot of us can have hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction. And for whatever reason, either we're pumping out way too much cortisol or we're not pumping out enough, even despite maybe environmental triggers. Your T3 is very good. Yeah. So my fire, oh, anyway, we'll get to that. But basically, yeah, my test is showing that I have high free cortisol. So again, I'm not producing a lot, but it's staying saturated in my tissues and it doesn't appear to be clearing quickly. I'm holding on to it. So I'm either, I'm either reconverting inactive cortisol back to the active form or I'm not clearing it well. I don't know which it is, but I'm, I'm assuming it's one of the two where I'm holding on to it or for whatever reason, my body is just reactivating the cortisone back to the cortisol. Whatever it is, it's problematic, of course, and I want to figure out what that is. And this is just another depiction here. I have more co cortisone metabolites. Um, my overall cortisol production is very low. So, but it, if you look at here, my total DHE production is pretty high, not because of that DHEAS, but because of these two steroid hormones I'm producing a lot of. Now this, you don't get this in this test. We get this no, in the blood. No, no. You do not get insulin and thyroid with this test. I just put that there to maybe help give you a better picture of maybe why I do or don't think those values are that way. So thyroid is a big, big part of this. So if you have a suboptimal thyroid, you're going to have estrogen and cortisol clearance issues. Um, it doesn't appear that my thyroid is suboptimal. It appears it's okay. Um, my fasting insulin also appears to be okay. So there's probably something else that's causing that. Um, I do have a lot of salt. Um, salt can take the inactive form back to the active form. And I didn't even realize this until I was researching, but I have a lot of grapefruit because we drink Spindrift and I drink probably way too much. And one of the flavors has grapefruit juice in it. So I'm drinking grapefruit juice a lot. Mm. So perhaps that's converting some of the inactive form back to the active form. I don't know. Um, having lower muscle mass and more fat can do it too. I'm trying to get more muscle and lose adipose tissue because adipose tissue can sequester cortisol too. So again, optimizing body composition is a big one. So, and I kind of put that down here, things I'm going to do to address my high tissue cortisol, um, strength training, um, lowering stress, weight loss. And really what I, what I mean by weight loss is body composition changes, vitamin C, methylated B vitamin. Again, that's the same theme throughout this whole presentation, phosphatidylserine, sauna to increase HGH levels, um, supporting my HPA axis. So, you know, it's interesting because in the past when I've done this test, my cortisol production was absolutely through the roof, which is, this is the first time it's not. And the difference between last time and this time was I'm not working full time in urgent cares anymore. So that's a massive stress relief on me. So that might be why I'm not really hammering out the cortisol anymore because I'm not nearly as stressed. Whereas before I'm stressed working like five days a week, 12 hour shifts, just absolutely miserable. So I'm like pumping out the cortisol. I don't know. That's the only thing that's 
massively changed as far as like lifestyle stuff between the last test and this one. So that's probably part of it. And I'm glad the cortisol production isn't insanely high. I just don't want my tissue levels to be saturated 24 seven because mm. Again, then I'm in a catabolic state. You're going to break down I muscle. I can't build muscle if my cortisol is constantly high in my tissues, yeah. even if I'm not pumping out a lot. Because if, if I'm always having this active state of cortisol, I'm constantly using the protein that I'm trying to put in. It's turning into glucose in my sugar, which is also not good. So it's uh, a process, but I'm going to figure it out. So this should be the last part, organic acid testing. This is pretty interesting. So I just put the um, numbers that seemed to be in range for me, which was the biotin, the B12, my gut marker, my melatonin, dopamine, neuroinflammation, oxidative stress were all in range. I definitely would like to see the neuroinflammation marker, the quinolinate, and the oxidative stress marker a little bit lower, but those were all in range, which I'm happy about. There's a couple that were out of range. So the two vitamin B6 markers, the uh, KYNA and xanthurinate, I can never pronounce that correctly, um, were abnormal. So again, pretty much I need B6 for both of them. It just reflects the fact that I need B6, which I already knew because my industry eval test told me that I needed that too. So high B6 or low B6 can cause those to be high or low chronic stress, reactive uh, oxygen species, high estrogen and cortisol, which can, same thing, I had both of those essentially. Even though my cortisol production was low, my tissue's high, my estrogen's high, so that can result in the need for more B6, basically. It creates a higher need for it. Um, let's talk about dopamine, that's HVA. So that, oh, this isn't going to stay up. Low levels of magnesium, FAD, NAD, and SAME can prevent the conversion from dopamine to HVA. Um, so those are just all things to consider if you ever take this test or you feel like you have low dopamine. You have to look at the upstream and downstream effects of that too. Um, cold exposure increases dopamine, so that's a big one. Um, I think a lot of environmental triggers can mess with dopamine and dopamine dopamine receptors i listed here pornography social media um, excess screen time anything where you're getting instant gratification you know going out to eat all the time and like having a lot of junk food all of this is gonna um, mess with your dopamine and your dopamine receptors you need to work hard for the things you want right so if you're constantly getting instant gratification from anything that's gonna mess with your body's own ability to make dopamine and desensitize your receptors. Wow. So that's a big one. Um, but yeah, then there's things you can do to increase that. Like I said, cold exposure is a big one. That's also gonna help with um, the VMA, VMA metabolites. Um, going on walks, um, anything where you are going after a goal is gonna help the dopamine because you're gonna to have to work hard for it, which is actually gonna increase your dopamine in the process. Instant gratification is toxic. It's not good for you. You shouldn't strive for instant gratification in, in any way. And it's going to mess up your dopamine, which is going to mess up your brain health. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, VMA is epinephrine and norepinephrine. Release from the adrenals. Um, low VMA means you have low norepinephrine and epinephrine. And it's a cortisol-dependent reaction. So it's no surprise that mine was on the lower end because my cortisol, again, was a little bit on the low end as far as my production. So that would all also make sense that these two are gonna be low. So the same thing, cold exposure and shivering can increase those obviously. So even if you have low, low production of cortisol like me, probably I need to do cold exposure like every single morning. Even if I can't make it to ice, I need to do cold every morning. That'll help my dopamine, that'll help my cortisol and that'll help my VMEA markers. So again, we cut off here, but overall it means I need methylated B vitamins, some glutathione precursors and cold exposure. And then the only part that it cut off was what I already said was I'd like to see the quinolinate a little bit lower and the oxidative stress marker a little bit lower. Um, but overall, that's pretty much everything. That's it? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Patients, uh, you can request to order this test at Iron DPC. We can order this. We can get it done. You just pee. How many times do you have to pee? So yeah, the way it works is you pee first thing in the morning, 
I believe you pee like two hours after you wake up. Um, there may be one in the afternoon. I could be wrong. Yeah. If there's not, then all you have to do is pee before you go to bed. So it's three to four strips. That's all you do. It's one day and then you can mail it out. It's really probably the easiest form of advanced testing that you can do. You just have to follow the directions on there as far as if you're taking any supplements, they might say to stop those just so you get a, a real idea of what's going on. But it's very easy. Yep. Good test. Yeah. Alrighty. See who Good does stuff. it.